Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, CPM seminar. And uh, it is really my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Bankaj Jha to uh, visit us. And so we've known each other like from our work for probably years, but uh, it was only like until recently we had some co-editing cool experience and then like uh, uh, got in touch. And uh, Pankaj is an assistant professor in the Department of, of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at uh, Syracuse University in the US. So his research is focused on building quantum hardware with uh, 2D materials and uh, petrol structure metamaterials and their hybrid combinations. Uh, Professor Jia's research has been highlighted by Berkeley National Lab, Kavli Foundation, Moore Foundation, and others. He was awarded a Google grant and a US Air Force Research Lab Free Visiting Factory Fellowship. Um, and Pankaj received his uh, master's, uh, integrated master's in physics from IIT Kanpur, his uh, PhD in physics, uh, at uh, Texas a and University from uh, with uh, Marla and Scully, and uh, his postdoctoral trainings um, at Berkeley with uh, Xiang Zhang and uh, uh, Caltech uh, with uh, uh, Harry Adler. So now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kai, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> so as, as Kai mentioned, we know each other uh, through our works. We both work in the direction of material and uh, um, but we never met. And recently we got invited to write a, a review paper or a perspective what we think about the, the quantum application of metamaterial would be. But then I, I, I touched base with Kai and then he was kind enough to invite me here. So this is my first visit to Canada. I have never been here. Everyone says Canada is cold. <laughs> so that's why I got this one. But it's, it's, not, it's, it's pretty much like similar to Syracuse. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, but that apart, I, I'm very glad to be here. This is my first visit, and hopefully not, not the last thing in Canada itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. It's cold in Syracuse too. Oh, it is. It is. I and is. I moved from Pasadena. I, I, I say it was, a, it was the most cultural shock for me. That actually compared to when I had to move from India to US. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a so little bit of more background on, on me. Uh, so I'm from, uh, yeah, in fact, like, the reason why I actually put this slide is because uh, back in India, I'm also from a state which is a born, which is at the border of India and Nepal. It's a very small town, and not even many Indians know where it is. So it's, it's a very small town. I, I place it there. So it's very close to Madhuani, which is at, at the border of India and Nepal. And the fun fact which I give to my audience is anyone with this last name as mine, JHA, no matter where they are in the in the in the world or the end of the edge of the universe, they all came, came from there. <laughs> they all came from there. Within I don't know, 50 kilometers uh, from there, they all came from there. Um, okay, so then I did my undergraduate from IIT Kanpur. Um, it's an integrated program. And till the third year, or the fourth, at the beginning of the fourth year, I didn't know what I wanted to do my PhD. I know I definitely wanted to do a PhD, I didn't know that. But in, uh, there was a course by uh, Harsh Wardman One, where he taught us atomic, molecular, and, and physics, in which uh, this, this textbook was one of the textbooks. I did exceptionally well, so that actually that was a sign that, oh, maybe this is what, what for me. So I, re I talked to my undergraduate advisor that I want to do a PhD with him. With Scully, things worked out, and I came to Texas. But that's how it, it started. Uh, OK, so now at Syracuse University, uh, this is my uh, group, or the brave soul of, of, of our group who actually does all the work, and I get the credit. <laughs> outside the Syracuse University, inside Syracuse, they all get the credit. Outside the I, I get the credit. Perfect. So uh, I got the first graduate student, uh, Jagi Rao. Uh, she she was uh, she actually came from IC Bangalore Physics Department, which, to my opinion, is better than IIT Kanpur Physics Department. The, by that time, when I was there, they didn't have the undergraduate. They also started undergraduate program. So that was the part which is which was missing. She came from there. Ami joined us uh, earlier this uh, summer from University of Tehran. Uh, then recently, I also got Ashwin Patnaik, a postdoc, joined us a couple of months ago from uh, IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Paolo, he's, he's actually an alumni from McGill. Uh, he graduated in 2020, I guess, around that time. 
And then he is working, as the key. he worked with me over the summer. He's a part of that student in the AD department, and he's also interested in working with the And Theodore Torotov uh, 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 is a freshman at Israeli University in Aerospace Engineering, and he's interested in quantum optics for, for aerospace application. And that's one of my research. So I think that he's, uh, he's really uh, working in my group. Um, I joined Syracuse uh, last fall. So those who are recent, they know that pain assistant professor has to go through to get this lab set up. I'm going through the same. Uh, but I'll show you where we are right now. So this is our, uh, this is the research area uh, in our group at, at Syracuse. So Jagi, she is uh, leading an initiative in which we are working at, we are working in harnessing the two, uh, superconductivity in 2D material. Like there are material which is like iron calcanite, iron calcogenite based 2D super superconductor. FTS is one of one of them with different stoichiometric ratio. And we want to make a quote unquote high temperature photo detector. And that's why I always like to put quote in here because depending on whom you talk, high has different meaning. For me, any temperature TC, which is greater than 10 Kelvin, if I make a photo detector out of it, it's already high temperature. Because in our lab, we also have uh, SNSPD detectors, but they all work at one to two Kelvin. So that's why compared to one to two Kelvin, 10 Kelvin is already high enough. So this one. Amir is working on designing metamaterial, and that's what like me and Kai we are we, are, we talk about is um, all that the field of metamaterial or like two-dimensional metamaterial, which is the metal surfaces, they have been applied for room temperature. Now what what I envision moving forward is can we use that one at cryogenic temperatures or not? So this is very contrast with respect to what is called the energy metamaterial field. I want to use it in cryogenic, like for instance, this SNSPD detectors. Can I integrate better material on SNSPD? Why I wanna do that? The reason is uh, for those who work with single photon detectors based on superconducting nanowires, there are some fundamental like constraint. Polarization is one of them. And the second is the light which falls on the detectors, they have to be highly collimated. And that's why they are always a single mode fiber couple. Coupling, coupling light to the single mode is already be tough enough. So can we can fabricate metamaterial interface with SNSPD? Can it like circumvent or kind of bypass some of these inherent challenges and solve that, uh, make, make it a more robust, more efficient uh, detectors? So that's my long-term vision. So what do I need for that? So here, first, the first fundamental question is, do metasurfaces or metamaterial-based optical elements work at cryogenic? Uh, I would be very surprised if they don't. But then it's over. So if the answer is very obvious, then why am I directly not doing the integration? The reason is, let's say if I make a metamaterial lens, and then its focal, uh, focal distance is 10 micron. Because of, the, because of the change in the coefficient of thermal expansion between the substrate and the material, maybe for, um, let's say, room temperature application whose focal length is 10 millimeter, a shift of one micron or two micron, it's, it's, it's okay. But if your detector is 50 micron, then a shift of four, three, five micron is a huge deal. So that's what we are looking at. Uh, working with, uh, so one of the companies, Quantum Opus, they make those SNSP detectors. So I, I, I'm working with them and see that, okay, can these metamaterial um, could work? And those are the initial experiments which we're working at. So Amir is working on designing those metamaterial lenses, optical elements. So, and the first optical element which we're building is a metamaterial based of uh, polarization beam splitter. That's the, it, like a polarization beam splitter we always use in an optics lab, but can make it a metamaterial out of it. That's yes. Then uh, Ashwin Patnaik is a postdoc in our group uh, with him, like some, uh, some of the like, resources that we'll talk about in here. We are looking at uh, defects in 2D material. So defects are bad, but bad, uh, it depends upon like what, what, what do you want to use it for. But we actually use those defects. Okay? Uh, one of those defects are the vacancies and the and the most famous example is, or one of the most example is the color center, and the center in diamond. It's just one of them. And so we are we are uh, harnessing those color centers in boronitride as a as a as a single photon source working at room temperature. So this is one of the uh, like a strong motivation for looking at boronitride. 
And I'll show you some of the major results which we have now. And then uh, last, like Paolo and uh, Fyodor Terry, they are working on uh, intelligent photo reflection and sensing. So what do I mean by intelligent? Machine learning. So to my humble opinion, there are two terms among many different terms is highly misused. Quantum and machine learning. These are the two things is highly misused. So I'm always very careful when and where and how to use that, that, that term. So when I say intelligent, okay, so intelligent, I can, I can get away with this. We all are intelligent people. We are all physicists. And I, I think if there is no physicist, we are all, you, you guys are also intelligent as well. Uh, so when we like many times we actually use our intuition to, to um, uh, understand the analysis. But now, can machine learning help? That's, that's the question which I'm asking myself. So with one of my collaborators from IT Bombay, we recently started working on, can we develop, can we harness the existing light classification model of machine learning to classify different spheres of light, uh, laser light, thermal light, different types of quantum spheres of light. So you have a single photon source, you have squeeze light, you also have single photon active thermal, single photon active chloride. There are many quantum spheres of light. Can we develop a model in which we collect the data for, let's say, 100 millisecond. And within data taken in 100 millisecond, I can predict, take the number, pass it through the model, and output is a classification that, okay, uh, the data which you gave me with the accuracy more than 8%, it actually came from a single photon source, or it came from a laser, or it came from a thermal source. We developed that model. So this is what we are looking at. Uh, that was, we did a theoretical, and at SU, when the lab would be, is ready, we'll do a proof of principle uh, experiment as well. So this, is, this gives you the bandwidth of the research group uh, being pursued in, in, our, in our group. Okay, so now the pain part. Uh, so I as you, uh, I am in the electrical engineering computer science, but both of my labs are in the physics department uh, because of the stringent requirement that uh, really, we work at single photon levels, it has to be really, really pitched up. So, we, so both our labs are in the sub-basement in, in the physics building. And they gave me two labs. One is the room temperature lab, uh, which is a little bit smaller. It was already uh, an optics lab for a, a faculty member who recently became emeritus. It was empty, so it, then it was already ready to go for that. So I started working on in that room temperature lab uh, as soon as I joined. So, and then this is the main cryogenic lab. All, I would say, uh, most of my research, which I talked about, uh, superconducting, everything is going to be worked out here. This is the picture I took a couple of days back to really show what is the status. This is the added cube um, cryostat, which we bought. Uh, it has now came uh, to the lab. So currently, when I, when I talk to our dean, I say that this is still, this is still a fancy storeroom for us. Right? Till, till the day, everything, the renovation will say that, okay, this is ready to do, and then you can bring in the optics, uh, start building the optics. Hey. So this is where we are in terms of the cryogenic lab. So uh, why, uh, while, I'm, while we are waiting to get all these things done, there are two, uh, as a faculty, research is, is, is an important part of my academic career. But an equally important part is teaching. <laughs> so doing that work, I built a very small, uh, at the room temperature line, I, I built a very small quantum eraser setup. And then uh, we had a two week, summer school program in, in which I took high school students, grade 11 and 12, and I showed them how does a quantum eraser work. Starting with the eraser, I really showed them this is the eraser, and that is a quantum eraser. And then they really explained, the first one hour was the explanation of what is a quantum eraser. Then I took to my lab and I showed them how does a quantum eraser work. And this is a picture from it. So I think, uh, so as I mentioned, like while I'm re getting ready to uh, get my lab set up, I also want to be like a little bit more productive on the other aspect of uh, being a faculty. And I strongly encourage any student, grad student, undergrad student, postdoc to ask questions. Uh, faculty is too. Uh, but I would, I would love to hear questions. And uh, please feel free to interrupt me during the presentation. It's, my, it's not my goal to finish, go through my entire slide. No. The message, some of the core messages which I want to convey, if that message is conveyed, I'll be more than happy to rather than uh, rushing up to my presentation. So please feel free to ask me any question. So today's talk, uh, I'm going to focus on two, I basically talked to two topics. First one was the last work which I did as a postdoc in Harry Agorosco, 
And then some of the recent work which we have started looking into, uh, room temperature. Uh, we are building that room temperature setup, uh, even though I'm working with FTS. Uh, and when I say FTS, is an acronym for, um, uh, let's say, iron, tellurium, telur selenide with uh, different stoichiometric ratios. So in a short form, we call it as an FTS. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about these two, these two results, but primarily focus on the research on uh, color centering in lower right? So single photon technology. Uh, single photon source is the one of the building block for photonic quantum technologies. And no matter how long I give a presentation, I can never overestimate the impact of a true single photon source. Anyone who does like that in the, in the photonics, for the photonics area, and these are just some few examples. So, what is uh, what is a? Um, I'm, I'm sure like many of many of us have already seen or read this sentence: a poor man single photon source is a laser, or laser is a poor man single photon source. And I strongly disagree with them, given the cost of the laser which we have to pay to get get this one. Because yeah, you can use a laser, highly attenuated, and call it as as a single photon source. But it's, it's truly, it's, it's not. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I disagree with that sentence that a laser is a, is a, uh, a, laser is a, a poor man single photon source. Yes, that's not true. OK, so what is a single photon source? I introduced the term, but let me explain what is a single photon source. And this is the way I explain it to my student. Let's consider a single photon source as a black box in which you are pumping that black back box by either laser or you can either you can do optical excitation or you can do electrical excitation. And then that black box emit one photon at a time. So if it is truly a single photon source, you will get one and only one photon at a time. That's, that's the definition of a single photon source. So, uh, and how do I know that the black box is actually a single photon source? Is here, so we actually do an interferometric measurement in which we take emission and this, let's say you have a pump, which is green 532, and the, and the laser uh, is, let's say, 630. Uh, and then we filter out the pump, you get uh, light coming up. So we select, we collect the emission from the black box, pass it to a single objective lens, use a simple uh, oscillator, I'm sorry, um, beam splitter, and then put single photon detectors at the end. So, and we do, we basically measure the coincidence count between these two detectors, these two detectors. So if the black box is truly a single photon source, then the, then the coincidence count between these two detectors when these two path lines are is zero, path difference is zero, then that coincidence count has to be zero. Because a photon which comes in, it either is going to hit here or is going to hit here. And in that regard, I think I like uh, what Roy Glover said, what is a photon? It's, it's a very fundamental and it's a very tough question. What is a photon? But as an experimentalist, I say a photon is something which made my detector click. It's into it. That's what my. But sometimes your detector can click without even photon also, and those are called dark current. I'm more than happy to talk more about it. But let's say in an ideal world, uh, a photon is is something which made my photo detector click. Okay. Okay. So ideally, if it is a true for, a true single photon source, there is no background. The coincidence count should go to zero. But in experiment, you always have some kind of a residual two photon count. So where does that two photon residual come, come from? Either, like as I mentioned, that maybe the one photon is from, uh, like one detection is from the photon, but other the dark current in the detector, that's one. Or no, no matter how dark you, you make your room, photons can penetrate to anything. Like it, it really like it, it can go to anywhere it wants. So those could be the second photon, uh, the non-zero uh, uh, residual photon count. The other could be from the back other from the laser. So you always get this kind of non-zero count. So many of the papers, when, when, they, when they show the value of G to zero, like 0 0.0003, I always look for, did they do a background correction or not? I always like to see what is the raw data and the background corrected data. That gives me an insight like how good the, how good the system works. Okay, do you look at that? So, uh, so I, I, I give you an insight of what is single photon source. There are already a uh, lot of candidates of single photon source. Uh, trapped atom and ion. Uh, you have quantum dots, you have molecules, you have color center in, in, in diamond. So why do I care about one more candidate? Or why, I'm, why am I particularly excited about the color center in diamond? 
So I'll, I'll give you some example. In especially like uh, we, our approach is to look at defects in boronitrite. So these defects add, act as atom-like quantum emitters. Here is the crystal uh, which we buy from a company, SQ Japanese, just one of them. I'm sure like there are two D semiconductor, there are other companies also. And you buy those crystals. Uh, this is a, uh, this is how a crystal lattice will look like for perfect crystals. But then let's say one of the boron is replaced by like, whether it gets a vacancy or it has been substituted by oxygen, carbon, many different elements. So those defects, when when you pump them, or sometimes they, you can pump the electrical also, they emit. those are luminescent defects. Okay, and they act as a single photon source. So. Um, I have worked in, in my in my um, in my research in, in boronitride. I have worked with both uh, crystal single crystal which you buy from the company, but we also grew uh, these boronitride using um, um, let's say let's let me see what that. Oh, CBD growth sample, chemical reputation sample. Now you. Uh, in our group, so our previous group, like we had like a uh, natural group, or let's say crystal from the company, and also single grown sample. And I worked with both of them, but from my experience, the quality of the single proton source is much better when we get it from the company. Because our, or what it means that our growth process was not clean enough, that, it, that the sample was already dirty, that it was not good. So why do, why do we still work with simply grown sample? Is because then you have a very precise uh, control over layer by layer. So we, we have we can go one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer. So if you have if you find a color center, you can very exactly within within the I don't know depending on how many you have, you very precisely know where your color center is. But for CBD one sample, oh, sorry, but for the uh, the single crystalline, we don't know. And that that was one of the fundamental important question which we which we proposed how to solve it and also solve it. And I'm going to show that result on this result. So uh, in these crystals, then uh, we use flux state, transfer it on a silicon substrate. So these are some of the uh, plates which I have. And one layer is 0.33 uh, nanometer. So based on the thickness measured by FM, we can extract how many layers it has. And it can go up to like literally one layer, 15 layer, 120 layer. Um, and then these are only some of them. There are many things in which there are many different colors. Then in the clean room, I, I was also very excited about that. Oh, what about the silicon substrate? But there are also um, flexible substrate like uh, PDMS, which we actually use for tra uh, transferring uh, one 2D material to another one. So I, I, was, I got curious and I was able to extract it. And not only that, I also ex extracted boronitide on my skin. I, I was very curious. And, but I already knew that boronitride is inert. So I already knew that nothing, nothing was going to happen. So please don't do that unless you really know that material is, is, is enough. So I was able to extract it. My, my curiosity was, oh, can I, because of the, um, because the moment you put it on a flexible substrate, then it opens up the door for flexible point of tonics. And the answer is yes, we were able to do it. And we were able to find colors and literally color centers which are bright enough and are visible to me and infrared on these kind of samples as well. It, it works there. But, so, yes. Is, is that the reason the CBD growth only happens on uh, vanadium oxide is that the reason why the biggest question is that sapphire vanadium oxide and then the HPM or uh, CBD one sample is on top of this one. Yeah. There. Oh no, so this one is the crystal which you bought, exfoliate it and transfer it on vanadium dioxide. Why? Oh, I'll show you why. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> because the, the question, the one. Okay. yeah, the, yeah, no, uh, the question which I asked about is how we can extract where the color center is located. For CBD1 sample, we know where it is between 10. If it is five nanometer, I know somewhere between in the middle. But if, we, if the sample is, let's say, 200, 300 nanometer thick, we don't know where it is. And it's a very, it's, it's fundamental and also technological uh, important question to know where the color centers are. And I'll show you why, why it is here. Yes. Um, just when you have it on the flexible substrate, can you like strain the material yes. by bending? Okay. Yes. And there's already paper which came up. It was like they actually put a PDMS, they strain it, and they saw how the zero corner line started. Yeah, and, and it's uh, reconfigurable. Like you can go back and forth. So it's like tunable single photo source. Yes. Uh, so boron nitride is, is not a new material. Uh, I was also like, when I started looking at boron nitride, if you look at the um, lattice constant similarity with respect to the graphene, is, is very similar, except like one is carbon and there's boron nitride. And because of the similarity, uh, 
It's like uh, boron nitride monomer is actually called white graphene. And even though they like the basic structure is the same, but because of the small like mismatch in the lattice constant, their optical electrical mechanical, all properties are, are very different, very, very different. And um, it has been used for like a number of like cosmetic ceramics, lubricant. I already got to know. I knew about lubricant, I didn't know about the cosmetics and ceramics, like they're both yes. Yes. Uh, this is the previous slide. Does the size of the defect matter? Size, okay. Defect is always atomic defect. Then now elaborate on your question. What do you mean by size of the defect? So over there in the uh, oh base. Okay, sorry, that, that's so a defect could be, let's say, a boron is missing by or substituted by oxygen, and then uh, you can have either vacancy there or because because of the different in the, 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 the bonds they can form, that acts as as a defect. It's a localized defect, and if you pump them, if they are let's say luminescent defect, you pump it op optically, it emits light in uh, visible to near infrared. So those are really atomic defect. So can I just ask for some clarification? Sure. So, so it's not clear to me why the, you're able to locate the position of the defects in CVD grown compared to exfoliated samples. Okay. I, so let's say I, I make um, a CVD sample of 10 layers and I find a quantum emitter, then it will be within one of the 10 layers. Yeah. That's the way. For the C, and you are asking questions for which the results are. For uh, the another reason for me not working with the single remote sample is the photophysical properties of the color centers are much better in the single crystalline than single remote sample. And that's one. And the second reason is the thicker the uh, flakes are, the more stable the quantum emitters are. So let's say if the, if the flake is 300 nanometer, then you have uncertainty anyway. Is, is it at the lower edge? Is it at the upper edge? If it's in the middle, your uncertainty becomes larger and larger. Yeah. So does that answer? Okay. So, okay. Okay. Fine. So I would think that you know the exfoliate you know uh, crystal down to five layers, you still know that sort of your defect is somewhere in those five layers. Absolutely, so it's, it's the thickness, but the quality of the really good stable quantumometers are present when you are about I don't know, 30, 40, 50 nanometers. Yes, that that's that's the main reason. One of the main reasons. Um, I have a question. Okay, so now uh, we, we talked about the raw, raw um, boron nitride, but then I think the way I think the mm, boron nitride entered the region of flatline, the uh, material, I, I give the credit to the discovery of graphene. So the graphene, uh, I, I don't think I have to say anything about the graphene, but uh, when there was, a, there was a huge mismatch between what was theoretically predicted, the electrical optical properties of graphene, with respect to what was experimentally observed. And one of the reasons was because graphene was uh, silicon, SiO2 was always considered as, as a substrate for these graphene devices. And SiO2 have like, um, there are a lot, a lot of charge trap, uh, traps are there. So graphene did not offer the full potential what it showed. So back in 20, uh, 2010, because of the structural similarity between um, boronitride and graphene, they use, let's say, what if we replace uh, SiO2 by, uh, by boronitride? And bam, you saw an order of magnitude better enhancement in the electrical properties. So that's how boronitride entered into the flat line. Now, before 2016, in fact, now in their own cell, like when I, when I work with EMDC material, I always either encapsulate it or make uh, SBN as a, as a substrate, but really pure uh, boronitride. So this is what like boronite is there. But then in 2016, this paper came out in which they showed that boronitride is an insulator with a band gap close to about six uh, EV. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wide band gap insulator. So wide band gap insulator, it's a very good chance that there must be some mid gap states, mid gap uh, states which can act as single boron source. And this is what they showed. Yes, indeed, uh, there are actually defects that are single boron sources in there. So that, that's how I see that, oh, graphene, substrate, and then it also has a quantum property. It can not only just be used for as a substrate, but also as, as, as a quantum property as well. So this is how I see the um, res research, how boronitride and the plan. So what is, what is the defect? I think uh, the question was, so 
Topaz. Um, topaz is a mineral which, without any impurity, is colorless. It doesn't have any, any color. But there are a lot of like topaz is basically a mineral. Uh, but you you must you may have seen like blue topaz, pink topaz. Those colors are because of the impurities. Some of the impurities are either chromium, manganese, iron, and they are luminescent impurities. And by just putting in the sunlight, if they have enough energy, they will start a different color. So those are the impurities we are talking about. And, and this is the way I explain that, how, how, what does it mean by nature's trap pattern. So in, in case of a, a white band gap insulator, uh, boronitride, you have band gap of 6 EV, they also have some kind of mid gaps, uh, mid gap states. You pump them optically, which is like 532, and then it emits radiation from visible to near infrared. So if you have a zero class, if you have a very classy zero phonon line and a very broad band, depending upon how strong the coupling with the phonons are, the phonon cycles. So this is a characteristic emission from a defect. The moment I see, so now I have spent so much time working with the color centers, I don't even have to do a G2 measurement to say that whether it is a single photon source or not. I just look at the line width of the zero phonon line. If it is narrow enough, I can say that, yes, it is. But then the reviewer, I have to do the correlation measurement to, to show that it is actually. <laughs> but yes, this is how a typical characteristic field spectra looks like. Okay. Now in the boronite, right, for a given sample which you have, uh, I have found color centers with a zero phonon line going from 550 to all the way till 804. So 804 nanometer is the longest wavelength which I have seen, or personally observed. Uh, the longest I have seen in the literature is 930 nanometer. That's the longest I've seen. Maybe because we always, we always use a silicon photodetector, which has, which has cut off around one micron. So our, and so uh, one open question is, are these all different color centers? The answer is most likely no. Maybe because they could be clubbed to, let's say, maybe this is one kind of color center, but because of the local strain, local homogeneity, their zero point line has started to have to shift. That could be possible. And I would be very, very surprised if it turns out uh, they are like huge kind of different color center, which has its own advantage. If it turns out that these are really different kind of point, it's an advantage, but most likely it's, it's not. So one of uh, my particular interests is in uh, when I was working at in the Air Force lab was this 585 line. Width. So 585 also matches very really well with one of the um, uh, D1, D2 line of sodium. So this opens up the opportunity for interfacing a solid state emitter with an atomic emitter. Saying is very easy, doing is very, very tough. And I'll tell you what, what selling is very, very tough. But yeah, but they, they got really excited about interfacing these color centers with uh, some of the sodium uh, atomic group. And in fact, my PSD, oh, let's see, quarter of my PSD was in atomic vapor when I was working with Sully. I was working with sodium, uh, sodium, rubidium, cesium. These were the atomic vapors which I, which I worked in, in the experiment. So, so yes. What about I mean, how the local dialectic environment, <clears throat> otherwise known as junk sitting on the surface of the Yes, like, it can shift. If it is stable enough, I would say it can live into a, a shift in the zero point of lines. So, I just wonder if you can explain this broad band. No, I know. Okay, so that's a good point. So here, when we do experiment, we always reach out to our theoretician colleagues and say that, oh, these are the numbers which I got, can you explain? And they do their uh, BFP, uh, density function theory calculation, and they said, okay, with a good, good, reasonable accuracy that maybe this can be clubbed to um, carbon related. And, but yeah, that's, that's one way. But there was a recent paper which came out in which in the CVD sample, they first found out what color centers are, where it is, and then they grow the sample, another sample in a carbon rich environment. And they did see that the population of the color center in around 585 went down. So that was a good indication that maybe at around 585, it's, it is a carbon related effect. So that, that is only one of the papers which I've seen, like maybe this is carbon. But uh, the jury is out on what was that. And uh, this was one of the fundamental questions. Yes, yeah. yeah, so uh, over the years, uh, I have worked with color centers found in literally one layer of atom. As you can see here, and then um, and we, how we confirm it is a really a monolayer uh, using an AFM. But doing an FM on a monolayer, we have to be very, 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 very careful. Very careful. 
And then uh, you can also do Raman. Raman is a little bit more like stringent, okay, so by looking at the, how where is the peak is from uh, mono layer and how does the peak shift when you go from one layer to two layer here. So this is already, already known, so that's why I know that it is that. So, so I have found the color center you literally wanted. So now going back to this is a crystal. I know very exactly where the color center is. It's in, in the in the in the left. Let's see uh, This is a exfoliated uh, single question sample. But then okay, so now I'm talking about the these things are good. But then why? What is the real excitement about the color center? So one other than having a true single photon source, one of the the most I would say the holy grail of having a single photon source is at room temperature. Can you really generate a single photon source at room temperature? Whenever we go to the funding agency, they say, oh, this is really, really cool. At six, can you make it at room temperature? But what they don't understand is it's not just linear scaling of the temperature, it's a huge challenge. The moment you go to room temperature, quantum system starts to not become really that, that, that quantum at all. I would say that there are many different experimental challenges. So one paper which came in 2020 in which uh, the same group which showed uh, uh, the presence of the color center, they also reported a paper in which they said at room temperature, they were able to observe transform limited or lifetime limited absorption lines. So that was a very, very, like I said, it's a huge game change. But since then, we haven't seen any other paper reported out. So what was so special about that crystal or that molecule that they were able to observe? And I haven't seen any other paper yet, so I don't know like whether that it has been reproduced or not. Recently, the last paper which, which I worked on, we were able to get near transform limited, but at cryogenic 6.5 Kelvin. We were able to reproduce this, but at cryogenic, but not at room temperature. Okay. So this is one uh, really good like, uh, like motivation. Then for in, in a typical uh, policy or any other sample which you work with very regularly, we get a very high debug order factor. And divide one factor is, is basically the ratio of how much of the intensity goes to the zero chroma line compared to the photo line, total emission itself. So you really want to, if you really want to have a single photon source, you want to make it as a like what do you want to do with single photon source? The first thing you want to harness is the quantum interference. To be able to harness quantum interference, you want to have the photon to be as identical as possible within within the within the line. Right? So if so whenever we are looking for a candidate which can act, which can generate identical single photon source, we start with, and this is a room temperature measure, we start with a good candidate, which already has a high dy water factor, which is more than about like, for this one, it was 0.92. So this is already a good candidate. So high dy water factor at room temperature, at like very regularly, we will find 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. So the highest I have found is 0.92. This is the highest which I have seen at room temperature for a solid state. So these are these are really good features. So everything looks good, but there are also like some fundamental open questions. We still right now, as of October 26, 2023, we there is still a debate on what is the nature of single photon source. What I mean by that is, is it an impurity? Is it a vacancy? Is it a combination of them? The zero is up. We don't know yet. There have been some recent report, but there is still an open, open question. That's one. The other open question was we and like everyone else we, we work with really thick uh, single question, but then where is it located? And I will show you like uh, some of the results. Uh, where is the uh, we, using uh, super resolution microscopy? You can find very precisely in the x y direction. But if you th take a thick sample, let's say 200, 300, 400 nanometer thick. You find where it is, you don't know like where it is located. And uh, if you want to use as, as a spin property like, uh, for spin physics, then you also have to find out what is the atomic structure, spin multiplicity, that's for open question about photon nitro. So it, it has shown promise, but there are still open questions which has to be addressed before we can really get excited about using photon nitro as a center. So can you explain, so the, this line width, is that just in homogeneous broadening? Like, uh, uh, at room temperature, no, it is not homogeneous. Okay. So, so what is causing the broadening? Just... So this one is still strongly, so there are two, there are two things, uh -huh. spectral diffusion uh -huh. and phonon line width broadening. Okay. So uh, there is one of the results which I'm going to show you at 6.5 uh, Kelvin and using star shift, we were able to really narrow it down within a factor of two of the line width line limit. So uh, by reducing the temperature, we were able to get rid of phonon, 
but then you also want to be applied the electric field to get rid of the charges that are there and get the language, uh, not emission, but absorption language close to a lifetime. So it's always a spectral diffusion and phonon back. Interact with the phonon. Since there are so many questions, sure. what's the divide wall factor? Oh, divide wall factor is the ratio of the, like, the, well, how many photons goes into the zero phonon line compared to the entire spectra itself. Okay. So if you want to generate, so let's say, let's say you really get this one as lifetime limited. And there's nothing at all. Then you go, every time you tell a photon, there are identical photons. And this is what you would like to do. OK, yeah. So I think uh, I showed like we have, we have got, like uh, from one layer, we also got a really good um, single crystal uh, exfoliation. You can clearly see the, uh, the quality of the resonances. And in this measurement, I try my best to keep the conditions either identical as, as possible. So you can clearly set, like, you for a, for a thick layer, the intensity is much higher, and also the amount of coupling to the phone sideband is, is much, much less pronounced or suppressed in, in a multi layer than compared to a mono layer. So I always work with like really thick ish uh, uh, flakes. Okay. Then it goes back to the question, the fundamental question is if, if, it, is all, if it is thick, then where these color centers are located? So I used to always ask my colleague that what is the answer, and they always say that it's located somewhere within the thickness of the SF. That's not a very scientific answer. <laughs> and, uh, but I also want to know why is this important? Why do I care about where it is? Because let's say if you have a truly single photon source, but then when in the, in the experiment, you always have an um, objective lens with a finite numerical average. And um, if, if it is a really trapped, trapped out of nine, it decays in four parts. So I have to really engineer the local density of states photonic environment says that all the light is not isotropic, but highly an isotropic, highly directional. Then in that case, I can really boost the collection of the single photon. And this, this is a very simple structure of metal insulator, metal MIM structure, which can get a directional emission. So to get a directional emission, I really have to know where the color center is and what is the type of orientation of the color center. Both of them are very important. And this is what we address, propose, and, and solve how to accept them. And not only from the technology point of view, but given the dipole orientation, we can, we can also get some insight on the fundamental nature of the defect. Remember, we're talking about, we still don't know yet. And then there was an idea on, uh, because it is 2D material, I can exfoliate it on, on an image. So can we exfoliate it on a single mode fiber, which we can pump, which we can, we, we can, we can pump. Um, uh, and let's, so exfoliate, Boronitride, which has um, a color center, which has favorable uh, spin states. Then, which can be read out, addressed. Then I can, I can put it on a single mode fiber and I can really do uh, uh, sensing on, on these devices. So I, I can do that. But that's another advantage of using 2D material. I can exfoliate it, anything, everything. So I think like this is something which we wrote and, and the reviewer asked, what do you mean by anything? And then uh, we really change that and say any device, device substrate. And that kind of makes sense. So before uh, really going to the answer, how am I doing with the time? Oh, I should really speed up that. Uh, OK, so to really explain uh, what, how we did it is to really extract, if we take a single atom in the HRI state, then the decay rate does not depend upon, it's an it's a, it's a quasi intrinsic property in, in the free space. It's a, it's a linear, homogeneous medium, it's an intrinsic property. But then the moment you break the homogeneity, you create an inhomogeneous, then, it, uh, then the decay rate depends upon the dipole orientation. Like the famous example, which we all see in undergraduate, is a dipole in front of a, male, uh, of a uh, let's say, a perfect electronic, or just a gold. X dipole behave different than the Z dipole. We all that. So this is what, what, what we harnessed. But then really to extract both um, the, the dipole moment, because we have two parameters, the dipole orientation and the distance. So we need another degree of freedom. And that extra degree of freedom by provided by an uh, interface whose refractive index we can change. That gave us an extra degree of freedom. And combining these two extra degree of freedom, we were able to really uh, localize where these color centers are. And here is that material. And this goes back to the question which I was asking. Uh, bor Boronitride sample, the, the color centers we don't know. Uh, using AFM, it was around three and a half, three and a half meter. VO2 is a phase change material, whose refractive index uh, changes when if you make a phase transition around 65 degrees Celsius. So at, at room temperature, uh, 
at room temperature, uh, it acts as kind of an you know, insulating state. And then the moment you try and make a transition from like 60, 65 degrees Celsius or above, you went up to 100 degrees Celsius, it acts as a like, kind of a metallic state. And you can clearly see that how does the refractive index, especially because one of our emitter was 600 nanometer, the refractive index changed. But this is a lossy, very lossy material. And this lossy, lossy aspect has some challenges on to find out where those color centers are. Because let's say if you find a color center which is very, very close to the VO2, it's highly unlikely that you will be able to measure it because of the quenching of the emission because of the loss imaging there. So that actually sets into what is the what is the closest you can find the color center to the view. That was it. And we found a solution. Like, what if we can find a material which is really a dielectric, less lossy, and we can we can lift that. Okay. Uh, then I'll quickly go it again. So here is uh, here is one of the plate. Uh, we always whenever we get prepare our sample, the first thing we do is do round, round spectroscopy and really determine that this is actually a boronitrite and not just a residue from uh, Scott state. You, you can, you know, yeah. So we do a uh, Raman, then we also do a photoluminescence map in which we look at the integrated TL at each and every pixel size, and pixel size is half a micron and half a micron. And this is how a typical photoluminescence map looks like. There are many, many different local hotspots. Uh, whenever I, when I saw this one, oh, maybe this is really there. But it's not. It's basically it sounds that because of the local um, inhomogeneity in either the sample or the environment, it was really a very broad spectra. It was not a zero point line. So we we physically go and see at each and every pixel spectra, and the moment we see this kind of uh, emission spectra, we know that this is a single point source. From our experience, it is a single point source. But then we also do a correlation measurement, which I showed with the short HVD measurement to really quantify that indeed those spots are actually a single point source. We do that. So we did. So we measured that uh, uh, for say, for let's like, say we found three emitters. Emitter A. We found how does the spectra look like at uh, room temperature and at uh, uh, 100 degrees Celsius. And we also did modeling in which we uh, and from uh, from the correlation measurement by looking at the slope, we can extract what is the effective lifetime. And either you do time resolve measurement, lifetime measurement, or you can also do G2. But when you when you do a correlation measurement, you have to be very careful says that the intensity of the pump are you have to really take it out. Otherwise, you, your, your result of lifetime is going to be skewed with respect to the intensity of the light. So we just wanted to make sure that we did take into account the effect of the lifetime. And this is the true lifetime which you measure. So the lifetime of the, the, the color center really uh, go up from, from uh, room temperature to 100 Celsius. And then we also performed uh, full D, like console simulation. So console is a software which do 3D simulation of electromagnetic. Um, so it's, it's basically an electromagnetic simulator in which if I know where the dipole is, if I know the electromagnetic properties of the substrate, I can extract the lifetime, everything. everything I do. So using console simulation, we extracted how does the ratio of the lifetime at room temperature 100 degrees Celsius will look like as a function of the distance D and also the polar angle. Because the polar angle is also uh, becoming an important part because you have you have you have a deeper phase. So the dashed line is the experimental value uh, of the ratio of the uh, lifetime, and then the solid lines are because when we extracted the lifetime, we, we, every experiment has has a as an uncertainty. So these two solid lines are uncertain. So in this in this so <laughs> let's say if you don't know what is the polar orientation, if you don't know what is what is the angle, then we know the color center is located at about. Um, 24 or 25 nanometer, and the uncertainty, the full width is 30 nanometer, or 30 nanometer to 22 nanometer. So this is all pretty good. I really know it is about 20 nanometer, and the uncertainty is anything from 30 to 22. But we wanted to go a little farther than that. We also really wanted to measure what is the polar angle. So then I really spent a lot of time in really understanding one of the, one of the papers in here, in which uh, we perform for, uh, emission polarimetry. What, what, what does that mean is you collect the light from a, a, a dipole and you change the polarization in the collection pattern to see how does the, how does the emission look like. And for um, depending upon whether the dipole is in plane or out of plane, uh, it looks kind of a tumble, or if it is out of plane, it kind of looks very nice topic. And then we performed the experimental me measurement. It, we, did get, we didn't get really perfect tumble, we didn't get a circle. It means that it, it does have a good vertical component. And then using modeling, we were able to extract, we were able to extract both in plane and out of plane dipole. We, we solved that issue. So I've just said, so now 
Then we were really able to find out where the color center is, what is the uncertainty in the polar angle, and what is the uncertainty. Un 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 so this showed that we were able to locate where the color, color center is with the, with the full uh, width uncertainty about 15 nanometers. So that was a kind of a really na truly nanoscopic um, localization of the color centers, plus 3D orientation of the dipole moment. So we extracted all the, all the parameters in this. So we devised, uh, we devised, we proposed and experimented and demonstrated a method of localizing. So one question which, which was like very obvious uh, uh, like, like to us was, okay, so we found a color center. We localized in VO2, but VO2 is not a typical device substrate. VO2 has its own advantage, but the typical device substrate with silicon SI2. So can we pick it up and transfer it to a silicon substrate? So the answer is yes. This is what we did. This is the same substrate. This is uh, HBM VO2 on a sapphire. We uh, picked it up. Uh, it uh, saw it, which was, who was all, actually, he did his internship at McGill when he was an undergraduate at, at Kharagpur. So he, he, he's working on uh, a dry transfer, and he showed that, yes, he picked it up and placed the same emitter on a silicon substrate. And you can see that there is a relative orientation uh, change, but uh, depending on if you had a very like, motorized way of really transferring it up, we were able to uh, make it there. So, and then we recharacterized the emitter, and uh, by, by looking at the relative orientation change of the two flakes, we were able to extract that indeed the inclined in dipole moment didn't change at all. The quality of the emitter did die, die off. Uh, they're still like open, like you know, one is another substrate, another here. So this actually gave us uh, an idea that maybe we can characterize on, on let's say, much better substrate, pick it up, and then transfer it on, on a device substrate. This, this, gave, this gave me a promise. So in at SU, we are looking into not reducing any lossy material at all. Can we do this one in, in all dielectric interface? That's what we are looking at at, uh, at SU. So moving forward, if we can do that one, then we can really interface, we can have an array of single proton sources that we can plug on on the So this is like moving forward. Um, and then I think uh, this is the experiment which I, which I talked about, in which I'm just showing you the result. So we, we fabricated a device using, um, like it, it is still the exfoliated boron nitride, but now this is gated by two graphene layer. And using start shift, we were able to uh, get rid of uh, local charges, but also able to tune it. And using start shift, we, we clearly saw a linear, um, linear scaling of the shift in the uh, resonance. Not only that, we also observed uh, in the absorption line close to 89 megahertz. Which is, which is um, I would say, within a factor of two, close to the lifetime limit. So, what, what, do I, what do I learn from that? Like, the take home message for at least this slide is we were able to get rid of the temperature part, but there was still a residual spectral diffusion that, that, that we, we couldn't get rid of. Um, if there is a good insight, I think I'm more happy to hear about, but this was already a good, good result that it can have. So, this is one result which I showed in, in, our, in the Air Force lab. We started thinking about, uh, like uh, I was talking to one of the research scientists there, this acts, so there are two things. It is very narrow band absorption line, and it is tuned. And we, in, in, in the result, we actually can tune up to 400 gigahertz. So this is a good uh, candidate for a tunable narrow band filter. Efficiency is going to be terrible, really, really terrible. But this can act as a really tunable filter. This was something that like, uh, uh, one of my collaborators and we started thinking about like making those uh, really uh, uh, narrow band, uh, large tunable filters. And okay, so, and then now, now we know that we can tune, then the next step would be is to find two emitters, which we can make close enough. Like can you do a quantum difference between two separate emitters? So I have worked with Bone Nightwork for about more than four years. This is the only sample, uh, these are the only two emitters which I have found on the same plate close enough that using star we can start to play. Uh, spectrally close enough and spatially far enough that we can manipulate individual on the same plane. Let me put, so I am putting a lot of constraint. So that's why this is the only sample which I found in the last four years. Hopefully like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But this gave us a hope that like two to three nanometer we can really shift and then make them do quantum difference between these two, uh, these two emitter cells. That was, that was good. Uh, uh, so where, where are we going with this? So one of my really ambitious goal is I want to have like all these color centers, color centers are all natural, they are like 
globally. They, they happen when they are grown. But I don't want to create a deterministic color center. That's all right. If you want to really make a device, scalable device, it has to be deterministic. So I'm not a chemist. I'm a physicist. So I think I, in, in, the, in, the, in the EE department, I'm high in the EE department, everything in the physics. So the physics faculty can tell me, you are now almost physicist. I said, what do you mean almost physicist? Look at all my degrees. They're all in the physics. So I am a physicist. But no, you are in double E, so you are almost physicist. And I said, OK. <laughs> so I said, I want to implant the entire periodic table in 2D material. That is my long-term mission. Well, why I want to do that? The reason is, there are a lot of, there are a lot of elements here which are naturally abundant. There are some of them which are very rarely found. So if these crystals are grown in, let's say, the natural conditions, then some of the candidates like carbon and oxygen, it can easily form the defects there. But there are elements like, let's say, manganese, uh, iron, iron is also really found in there, but iridium. I want to implant those in, in those materials and see the whole bandwidth of the color center which I showed, does it match with those resonances now? If it does, <laughs> Maybe it is one of those impurities. It is. I'm not saying like it, it is truly it is, but it is here. Maybe that is one of the impurities. But I guess we don't have an iron implant. So I reached out to Sandia National Lab. Uh, Sandia National, they actually has a program. And they say, no, we don't want to, we, we cannot implant everything because you have the project is for one year. You can't do it. Okay, let me select one. So for uh, Sandia National Lab, I selected manganese, magnesium, iron, and iridium. And for La Salmas National Lab, uh, I said, OK, let's do carbon and oxygen. The, I was also put into constraint that, OK, they are already working with these elements. So it's very easy to do that. So these are the five uh, um, elements which, which we are going to implant it. We wrote a proposal. It's under review. Most likely, it should go through uh, because uh, they are already interested in, in boron nitrogen implanting. So this is what. So the, the way it will work is we do the brief characterization, send the sample, ion implantation, re, re, uh, um, let me recharacterization and sign what, what the changes are. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yes. Question about that. I am a little bit of a chemist. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you run some calculations? Absolutely. Yes. And that's a good point. So, I reached out to one of my. Uh, stuff under chemists. boron makes sense. The stuff under nitrogen makes sense, but some of the other stuff is. So, uh, I reached out to one of my chemist colleagues, and he, he's a clinician, and I asked him, uh, Ari, I want to implant these ions. Can you give me an insight on which one would be good enough and where the where the zero point lines are? Because that will uh, really help me out. Right now, I'm blindsided. Blindsided, but still skewed, because I cannot just take, let's say, um, lanthium. I don't even know like whether where the zero point line, whether it would actually luminous and defect or not. And the second is, if it is, whether it will fall within the photo detector, which I have in the lab. So there are a lot of constraints. Yeah. What so, kind of defect would you need to include a lab, for example? Like all these very important questions. I I I, I don't know. I, so like, yeah. So recently there was a paper in which they implanted cerium, and uh, the zero point line was in the visible gene. So that gave you okay, maybe erbium may not. Erbium is one point five micron that came from because of the, some technological advancement there. But yes, and you, if you have any any insight, I would love to hear it more. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was I was I was told by uh, so this is in collaboration with one of my like mentors at Texas and I'm also now a collaborator. He said that if you write this proposal in the U.S., more than hundred percent you will not get funded. <laughs> Absolutely. But if you write if someone writes this proposal in Germany, it will get funded. So and he gave me an example of John Mayer who did who is actually working on something similar uh, and he said like oh he's looking into implanting the entire periodic table in that and he's probably did really get funding so that's what the Philip Hammer told me that one uh, but I don't know uh, I said I don't want to get that ambitious but I'm ambitious but with with a let's say um, um, realistic touch and I said so then, let me just start with the, some some of the periodic table. Okay, so I'll just quickly, in the next few minutes, I'll show you some of the results which you have in, in the current world. Um, all the photo detectors which we work in our lab, they all work at, uh, uh, especially the superconnecting nanowire based detectors, they work at one to be Kelvin. So we are working with material uh, FDS with uh, TC around 13 Kelvin. We haven't measured the TC, we haven't measured the um, superconducting phase transition temperature, because like once the lab will be ready, we will do that one. 
But uh, we are doing some kind of characterization, like Raman spectroscopy, to get where those some pre characterization of this crystal. We borrowed the crystal from HUFN. We got it here. We are uh, working through uh, the boron nitride. So Jagishi is working on uh, Raman characterization on the same flake. Uh, in parallel, we are also building this confocal microscope, which will, when it is ready, this, this is a room temperature. So the photo detector FPS is, is, is a material in which we don't even know what is the refractive index of that material. So if you want to make a photo detector and optimize it for a given wavelength, then you have to put it in a cavity. So put it in a cavity to design a cavity, you have to know what is the refractive index. So when I reached out to one of the NSA NS program managers, he said that in the summer, Measure the factor index and then get back to it. They said, okay, then this is what, like, what we are doing. We are measuring the factor index. So once the step is ready, everything will work out. And with that, this is my summary slide. In which first I talked about uh, really localizing color centers. Uh, we also found uh, some really good choices of color centers with uh, near transform data emission line, and then recent results on spectroscopy of the new FPS material. With that, I would like to thank all the folks like with whom I had the privilege to work with, Caltech uh, Career Group, my collaborator at Tarpur, Prasanta uh, Sao. So he is one of the best grower I know of not heterostructure, like um, transverse heterostructure, but lateral heterostructure. And he's really interested in doing spectros most of the spectroscopy uh, of these materials. So uh, he's at ID Tarpur, then my collaborator at ID Bombay Instrument with Machine Learning. And then my current collaborator at Syracuse, uh, my mentor, one of my mentors at Texas A&M, and then moving forward um, uh, for La Salle, Sandia. And then my postdoctoral work went entirely funded by Boeing. Uh, why Boeing is interested in this, I'm more than happy to share, but it, they already funded my entire research at Caltech. With that, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. And all the questions, I really love those questions.